<laughs> I just noticed that we have, um, I didn't notice, I knew that, um, Barney Trooper and Councillor Andy Cranston are Zooming in today, so we welcome them to the meeting. And I invite Mr. Tupra to open with a karakia. Uh, kia ora tato, tino tato, let us pray. Hei mu koe a mātou i hoa hei tohu tohu i a mātou mahi katoa. Ko koe anō hoki hei whakakahi a mātou ki a whai klori ai koe a mātou mahi katoa. He mea tīmata, he mea mahi, he mea whakoti roto i a koe. Ki a whiwhi a hoki hei tohu ki tōma tonu i te mea tawhai tēnei e koe. Ko i karate o ki tōma tō araki. Go before us, O oh Lord, and all our doing with your most precious favour and further us with your continual help, that in all our works begun, continued and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name, and finally, by your mercy, obtain everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Kia ora. Thank you, Mr. Chupra. Now, someone else around there, Mr. 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 Mr.
Um, through you, Chair, I'm happy to speak now or to wait to do it as part of the presentation, either or. Welcome, Mr. Roderick. We knew you were on the way. Thank you. So I welcome um, all of our community advisors to the meeting and acknowledge uh, any of the media who um, and the public who may be listening. Welcome to the Regional Transport Committee. We acknowledge Mr. Tupra and Councillor Cranston at um, zooming in. Are there any questions with relation to the governance work plan, which appears on page 10? The action sheet. Sorry, the action sheet, which is page 9. That's been carried forward. Road safety report, thank you. And the work plan is on page 10. Are there any queries around any of those reports? Just around, uh, is I guess the intention to have something come into um, the, the governance, well, not so much the governance work plan as the action sheet with regards to um, information provided to this committee around the flooding, uh, there's clearly information being gathered and worked through with Wahu Putahi. Um, just knowing when, you know, what, what the timelines are for those kind of things, it's of, of real, real interest to sure. our community. And um, obviously we're gonna get a bit of an update today, but I presume there's a more formal something to arrive somewhere. Yes, I'll ask Ms. Dover to speak to that please. Um, apologies that Mr. Wilson is away. He'd probably be able to give you a more definitive time frame. Um, to see, oh, it is. Through you, Chair, wearing another hat. <laughs> um, the recovery plan will be coming, be coming to you as part of the civil defence thing, and that has a lot of the time frames in the action plan in there, and it's a joint regional recovery plan. So, whatever's happening with Waka Kotahi will be in there as well. Sure. Well, would the chief executive like to respond? Sorry, I didn't hear what the question was. Right, Ms. Noble will speak to the rest of it. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you. it was about when more information would be coming to the committee or to council about um, responding to the floods and repairing the roads and building resilience um, post flooding. So there's some information in our quarterly report here, but when a more detailed picture can be received. Yeah, so as per what Miss um, Con had advised, that's part of the Civil Defence Recovery Response Plan. So as your regional responsibilities under the SEDM group, we'll go to that committee. So, um, so will there be an aspect of that? Because obviously the substantial budget will be probably voting. Um, that, will that come to this committee? No. Uh, no, not the, the budget of that. That will, so there'll be... Two, two goes at this, one with through the recovery response and, and the civil defence group, one with your finance um, and performance head on in terms of the overspend that would have been accumulated as a result of spending on emergency works. Are you happy with that, Ms. Walthop, Councillor Walthop? Thank you. Perhaps we'll follow it up later. So the minutes were agreed, work plan. The work plan just indicates when you're going to get those reports to our May meeting, which you will have um, contained within the agenda for today. We have had no requests for leave of absence, nor acknowledgements or tributes, nor public input and petitions, nor extraordinary business or notice of motion, nor adjourned business. So we move to item 10, the report of the chief executive and staff for information. This is the third quarter monitoring report and appears on page 12 of your agenda. Papers from Ms. Charlotte Knight, are you presenting it? Ms. Knight is online and should be able to present to you. Yes, I can see her on the screen. Thank you, Ms. Knight. Do you wish to give a quick overview to the matters contained within your paper? Uh, yeah, I can do a quick overview and I'll just take the majority of it as read. So, um, as 
as you're all aware, each quarter you get a monitoring report about the progress against the Regional Land Transport Plan 2021. Um, this um, paper relates to quarter three, which is from the 1st of January to the end of March. It obviously includes a little bit of um, information around the flooding, given that that happened in March. Um, it also includes progress against um, the measures that you have and targets that you have in your plan and um, some, some updates around some of the operational works, like for example, the road safety program, some of the um, capital works and some of the operational works as well. Thank you, and you're um, open to questions? Yep. Thank you. So you have the report, which I assume one is read, and I invite questions. So Ms. Knight or Ms. Noble. Councillor Cranston. Sorry, Councillor Cranston has your hand up. Councillor Cranston, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, item 17 on page 16, the funding for the uh, Tyra Hero Cycle Walkway. Um, it's been listed there as the project is classed as possible and it's out of this funding year. Um, I do know that the recent budget had under the climate change banner more funding available for cycleways and walkways. Just wondering how we can get up on the priority for that. We've been chasing this around for quite a while now. And, um, you know, I travel the country all the time and see these new cycleway walkways popping up all over the country. And we seem to be forever at the back of the queue, which I'm not very happy about. For me, it's very much the end of a puzzle. We've got all the way out to Wainui now, and the uh, initiative is to get that access to the schools. And once we've got that access to the schools and in fact the hospital, and as a tourist uh, opportunity as well, that is the end of a very, very big puzzle and it will uh, be the culmination of something pretty fantastic for, for our region. So I'm just wondering you know, how we can get at prioritised a bit better than it seems to be. We seem to be getting shunted back a fair bit on this and I'm not very happy with that. Thank you, Councillor Cranston. I'll put that to Ms Stewart. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cranston. Um, we appreciate the sentiment and the frustration on this one. Um, I would just acknowledge that it is in this NLTP and it has been classed as possible funding. Um, the activity class for walking and cycling was significantly uh, oversubscribed in this NLTP. And while the recently released emissions reduction plan does have a very strong emphasis on walking and cycling, uh, that doesn't change our current investment decision making and what's attributed funding. So I can't give any indication right now that there is more funding available that could change, but right now I, I would be misleading you to say that. One thing that I would note though, is that our team in the region is very much aware of the importance of this last part of the puzzle for your walking and cycling. And I would give you some reassurance that the teams are working closely together to see if there is an opportunity once the walking and cycling activity class has been reconciled at the end of this financial year, if there is any further funds available and could we secure that under um, uh, the, the possible funding for this project. So the team is working hard with your team to see what can be done, but I can't give any guarantees at this stage. You aren't able to give any clarity on the great mystery of prioritization of these projects. Sorry, can you repeat that, Councillor Cranston? That was quite hard to hear. Can you please repeat the question? Just wondering if there's any, uh, any idea of how the prioritization works because yeah, it seems to be a bit of a mystery to us how, how to get it under that priority, how it is all prioritised, because there's definitely cycle ways going up all the time as we speak. So how does that prioritisation work? It's perhaps a more detailed question that we can give you some further advice uh, offline, but certainly when the your RLTP and the significant projects go um, forwards for consideration, they are all ran through on a national basis and investment prioritisation framework. 
this particular project attracted enough of a prioritization to secure possible funding so there were others that were ahead of it that were deemed of a higher priority and that's generally due to the amount of usage the connectivity the role in uh, mode shift uh, the the usage of it um, and, and the form and function of it for a particular region or city um, more than that way i would need to get some further details from the investment team and the activity class manager okay and one on the same matter, but back at council, the next next item talks about going ahead with a single stage business case anyway. So uh, what, what does that entail? That's council activity. If I yes, that's what I said. It's item number 18. I said one, a question back to council. Yeah. Yep, Ms. Noble will respond to that. Thank you. And then just so Mr. Trooper knows, Mr. Trooper next and then her worship. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair, I'd ask Mr. Hadfield to describe the, the business case process in detail because his team is more involved than me. Yes, so with the um, detailed business case, it, it just basically, in a nutshell, you just have to find out what, what are we trying to achieve. And um, one thing we did notice is that we probably have undersold what we're trying to sell in terms of, we're just looking at a physical asset where we haven't really done a clear linkage is, is that... Um, Joe Noble's team is doing an integrated catchment and Spartina removal project, and there's Kainga Ora development along there. And then the Rail Reserves team have told us that there's linkages also to the open spaces strategy, which is what we really need to do is interweave that whole story. And I know that we're calling it the Tarahiru business case, but there's a bigger story to tell. And then we can line up all our shareholders and stakeholders, including Iwi, coming up from then, that's the story. It's a, it's just not a the Tarahu walk, walkway. There's a bigger story. And I, look, our team probably realized we just need to push that up the chain a bit to get some more clarity on it. And then, like I said, there's a lot of potential there. We just have to reset. And that's something that our team has to give back to the chief executive and which will come back. We probably aren't undercooking what we're trying to do. And yeah, then thanks we, can for that. Linda, we can give that to Kaima or we can give that to a government and hopefully we have Iwi on board because that's one weakness we've realised. We haven't actually determined what Iwi's aspirations are. <coughs> we've linked yeah. it up and then we're away with a story. Thanks, Dave. Uh, yeah, just, just the clarity I was searching was the, the wording of single stage business case. I was just uh, didn't want that to be, okay, we're going to do another 300 metres or something. So what does single stage business case mean? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so... What we does is what are we if we if we're getting investment from council and Waka Kotahi, what are we actually trying to solve? And will that deliver what, what we're trying to solve? So what's the problems? You know, is it safety? Is it connection to schools? Is it all, you know, a closer access to the river? What are we trying to resolve and what money, wherever it comes from, is going to fix that? And then how are we going to prove back to the community and to our funders that we've achieved that? Mm -hmm. So that's what we've got to detail. Right in a simple sentence to, to our funders, but also our community and our politicians. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Trent. Uh, Mr. Trevor, thank you. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, if we could go to page 35 of the report, and there was something I noticed as I read the report, which caused me some concern, and it's the bus that's there. I don't know if we should all have that in front of ourselves to look at. Now, I worked and spent some time in Auckland and a number of accidents occurred where people stood on the very edge of the footpath when buses, particularly buses, rounded an intersection like this. In this case, this bus is turning left. My concern, and I guess if it could be noted and possibly followed up, is that if there is somebody standing on the very edge of that footpath, if the bus doesn't get its line right, there's going to be an accident. My question is, which need not be answered now, would it be prudent for a barrier to be put there? And I'm assuming there should be a barrier on the other side as well. Just a comment from me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, perhaps Mr. Hadfield might like to speak to that. Are you the authority on the new Palmerston Road roundabout? Yeah, I th I th yes, I am. And, and I think the team have just waited. Can we just wait till the paint dries? There's, and then, then, you know, we know that we've got, we've built a few roundabouts in the city. Let's let the, um, 
you know, the, there's a lot of safety stuff there. It's been reviewed. Just, just let the project finish. We're aware of it. You know, people told us you couldn't get a bus route. We told them we can. We can get a bus route. Just wait till everything's finished. Did you hear that, Mr. Cooper? Yes, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Hadfield. Thank you for raising the issue that you raised. Uh, the Worship the Mayor had a question. Thank you. So I don't have a question, but I have some feedback that I have received in the last while. Is it okay if I share that? It's Please. not a question. So I want to take you to page 21 and 22, and then I'll quickly talk about page 25 as well. So in the last little 21, the extensive work that has happened in our region, and my office have received so many emails saying, thank you so much for the huge amount of work that's happening. But not just that, what people noticed this time is that we communicated well with them. And I do want to um, highlight the flashing boards that tell people there will be work around here. It really changed their lives if they know I cannot reach my property. And then also in Stout Street, I know the work is starting there in the next while. There were boards up there saying we will be working in your area well. So I just want to say to our roading team, but also to our Waka Kotahi team, our community really values good communication so that they can plan accordingly. And um, then I just want to publicly thank the CEO and her team, as well as the Waka Kotahi team. If you take a look on page 25, what has happened in our region in the last two months? That is on top of business as usual. So I just want to publicly thank you for the huge amount of work that went into opening 55 roads to get people connected again, because in the end of the, at the end of the um, day, that's what matters to people, that they can get to their home, they can get their kids on the bus, they can get their produce um, out of town. So I just want to, that page 25 tells a story of its own. So please convey the thanks to your teams. Thank you, that's me. Thank you, Your Worship. Back to our report. Do we have other questions? Thank you, Councillor Worsnop. Um, that's a really good segue. <laughs> um, so I think that the uh, bit that I was getting, trying to sort of tease out earlier was in light of the enormity of what our um, network has been dealing with, what our staff have been dealing with, and just resources full stop. You know, the, the rocks that went in under the Tukumaru Bay bridge, bridge just don't appear out of nowhere. You know, somebody had to quarry them. And there's a lot of, lot of work that's gone on. Um, to, to what extent, because we have, a, you know, we have a, um, a, a plan that we work to, and there is no way that that plan has not been affected by this. Um, so I, I think you know, it would be helpful for us and um, certainly for Waka Kutahi to understand the extent that our plans are implicated by the enormity of this event. For, for much of our region, um, it was as bad as polar. Uh, certainly there are places, plenty of places as well, could I know, well, no, <clears throat> if you were driving on those roads, you probably would have been a meter underwater. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that probably is, is something that I think I would appreciate, mm. even though I know it's, it's in civil defense, it, it, I, would, I would love to have something albeit even if it's just an excerpt from those um, ones that do go to civil defense so that this table has a really good comprehensive understanding of the degree to which that event has in some ways um kind of derailed a little bit our plans uh or certainly our bau yeah can yeah. i um Ask the chief executive if he wished to comment because there is a time frame and there is material being collated, so yep. we understand that. So, would you yeah. like to speak to that? Thank yeah, you. There is. Um, uh, thank you through the chair. Um, so we can do that. It's just in terms of the timing um, as well. We'll have some. We've got a report coming to finance and performance, which is looking at the capital works program over overall and how that's been impacted. Mm -hmm. So that will also have some information on there. There will be further information in terms of local roads through your operations committee. Um, but there's no reason why we can't compile that for the purposes of others sitting around the table to get an understanding. Yeah, especially in light, obviously, uh, in the next year, I don't know, when do we when do we start the process of planning the new plan? Um, you know, to what extent have events like this, and certainly the government's narrative around adaptation, um, what does that mean for the way that we do prioritise things? So, um, yeah, all good stuff to be mindful of in this committee. Um, 
just uh, speaking of specifics, though, uh, would, I'm aware that we did a fantastic and amazing job getting the Tukumaru Bay, Bay Bridge reinstated, but I do note that it was uh, it was reinstated tempor well, temporarily is the wrong word, but it's not a permanent fixture, is it? It's a, so, that's an NZTA, and that's a real are, are you able to, is this the right place for that, or should I wait for the N, uh, NZTA report on on that? It, it is mentioned in this report. Mm. Um, Feel free to respond. And I may just declare, Norbert, are you able to comment with the bridge at all? It's not the bridge, it's the approaches. Everybody confuses it by calling it the bridge. Yeah. Oh, you need to put your speaker on, he won't be able to hear you. Thank you. Sorry, Rob, are you able to comment on the um, approach and exit from the bridge on State Highway 35 and the permanency of the current fix? Uh, kia ora, everybody. Look, uh, I think my understanding is that uh, State Highway 35, it is the approach to the uh, bridge. I understand there is still some uh, permanent sealing to be conducted on that, and that's as far as I can comment with any sort of certainty at the uh, moment. I can find out more if you wish me to. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. That's great. Thank you. I just can't find it quite in this page, but supplementary to the questions that Ms. Councillor Warsnop has asked, that, and the weather has created some delays to our sealing program and things like that. So there are some subsequent impacts that might not be quite as um, traumatic, if you like, as the photographs that are in here, which are instant pieces of additional work that's caused that weather that went on for so long and the need to attend to some of that work has actually delayed other work. And I, I do know that for a fact that it is going to delay some of our research program until 22, 23. So I understand that a, a substantial report will be provided to go to Whakakotahi in July for the emergency work funding. I believe that's the time frame, isn't it? Um, yes, again, and Rob, feel free to jump in, but my understanding is that Gisborne District Council and your Chief Executive as well um, are just preparing that application for submission shortly. It'll then go through our Delegations Committee and then onto our board, given the significant size of that application. Yes, I'd, I would just like to support a bit more information on that. Um, that is correct. There, um, There is a team of people working behind the scenes on how best to manage this and it may include setting up a recovery steering group such as the extent of the, the works that is that is required uh, to process this funding application through the system. Uh, it looks likely that we have been advised likely to receive the funding application for the local roads uh, emergency funding application maybe this week, tomorrow, today, uh, with the next couple of days anyway. Once we've got that, um, our senior investment advisor on the on the ground will work with uh, Gisborne District Council to um, examine the sites and then we'll start processing it through the system. We've already articulated through our organisation um, likely scope and size, but we're hesitant to obviously jump the, jump the gun. There has to be a thorough, thorough process. Thank you very much for that clarity. Thank you. And I, I'm, my reference to July, I believe that's the board meeting of NCTA. Thank you, Councillor Walsnop. I would just like to point out that we're quite happy for you to jump the gun. <laughs> <laughs> There's one further matter contained within the report on page 31, if I can jump my pages. Let me quickly look. No, this is with respect to the community driver. Um, well, it's a mentoring program, but we still do have real concerns about the ability for young people and not so young to be tested. And I see that this particular Naara Pai program has um, expected to pass 60 restricted licenses at a minimum in the financial year. Um, so, do we want to hear more from Wakarotahi in this report or? Is council in a position to add to that, Ms. Knight, at this report, or would you like to wait till we hear from Whakakotahi and their report around driver licensing? Uh, yeah, perhaps wait for the Wakakotahi. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Are there any questions further to the report around the table? No. 
So the re recommendation for the receipt of the report or the noting of the contents appears on page 13. Oh, beg your pardon, Councillor Cranston. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the report talks about uh, the issue of price escalation at the moment, which is not going away. Um, is there a risk of planned project drop off because the numbers get too out of whack? And how do you handle that? And also, are we into sort of a bulldozer effect of what we've got in our work plan for next year? Is all well, would you like that addressed by Mr. Hadfield? Yeah, um, with this three year program, um, absolutely, we've got funds and we're going to have to manage those funds within our, in our allocated budgets. We do have, uh, and then there was a, what we called a, a cost of doing business or inflation clause, but it's way out of kilter what's happening now. So uh, I'm not going to raise expectations. Somehow there will be, there'll be less reseals or less areas that we're going to have to manage to fit within our three year budgets. Mm. And then there's the reset in the next three years. But that's, that's just not you took um, roading, that's across the whole business, though. Well, yeah. Mr. Tupra? All businesses, too. Did yeah, thanks for that. Tupra? Sorry, Madam Chair, I forgot to lower my hand. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cranston. Um, Mr. B Councillor Burdett had moved the contents of the report, which appears on page 13. Is there a seconder, please? Councillor Wars not a seconding it. Are there any further questions around the table? Sorry, just check person. Um, when you mentioned about that driver um, scheme, I noted in the report that um, they said the last driving instructor was about to retire. Is, am I correct about that? And have we got some solutions for that? Yes. Because it's we'll a fantastic program and obviously we don't want to falter at the availability of um, good staff. Quite right. Thank right. You. Um, it was agreed that we'd take that during the Whakakotahi because it is a really important issue. So when we get to Whakakotahi's report, we'll have an in-depth conversation around driver qualifications and testing. So we've noted the report. I'll put that to the meeting. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, carry. Thank you. So the next item is the regional Whakakotahi's update, May 22, and that appears on page 47. Thank you. Ms. Stewart took, I'm sure she won't mind if I tell you, she took the time to take several hours with Mr. Gilmore, um, I presume in a log truck yesterday. And so she has very current experience of our roads, including um, state highways, local roads, and forestry roads. So thank you for taking the time because that is the reality for many people that live and work in Tyrapati. So it's good that you had time for that. Yeah. Thank you. And my nerves have just about recovered <laughs> from the forestry tracks. Um, it was and um, couldn't be with us, but Campbell Gilmore extended an invite off the back of one of the previous RTC meetings, which I willingly took up. Um, and it was fascinating. It was great, but also as well to have a look inside of one of your you know, large businesses, large employers and all that they do on a day to day basis. Um, from health and safety, compliance, but looking after their staff, the investment that they make in training youth and looking and sourcing local employment and some of the challenges within that as well. So it was, it was a really, really good afternoon yesterday. But um, my, those drivers have got nerves of steel. <laughs> and I would say it feels very different to ride on our roads in a large truck than it does a car. Um, I think we're just getting the um, presentation brought up on the screen. I think everyone's got a copy of it, so let's... Uh... Uh, I think that's the detailed one. I think um, there's a separate presentation. But I think we've got a and, I um, think one. Yeah, yeah okay. that's, we'll not go through that one. That's one that happy to take questions on. Um, we'll run through a few updates from on our national programme of work. And then we also have um, an update on the new land transport rule, the setting of speed limits 2022. 
um, and we should have uh, some of our team joining us hopefully online just in case there's any specific questions that you have because it does require some additional involvement from the RTC in the development of speed management plans under that rule. Uh, and then we'll move into the more specific regional update, including an update on our driver licensing work. Tom, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> that's the wrong one what's the other one that's the one that's in the pack there should be a presentation one um Can I share my screen? Not yet. Maybe. Sounds a little freezing. Can you speak to your presentation that you might have on your own iPad? Um, let's go. I can absolutely. Um, I don't know how much value that's going to add without you able to see. Well, in the middle of the minute, maybe, <laughs> maybe we get the other one up in time. In time. Let's see what we can do to start. So um, in terms of a few national updates, the first one is the release of the 30 year plan for the national um, transport system. Um, the, all of our local government partners have fed into. Um, the 30 year plan sets out a future vision for what the land transport system will need to look, look like uh, over the next 30 years. And it will steer what we, what you as partners uh, will plan to achieve and the de desired future state of that land transport network. So the form and function and how we want the, the system to, to look and feel to road users. That will be very much aligned to the long-term uh, outcomes set by the government. 
um, particularly as we work through the development of the next RLTP, this will be a resource that we will call on more and more collectively as we plan. Um, the 30 year plan is available on our website so that you can all have a look at it at your leisure. Um, the next piece of work really important as well for all of our partners is the business case refresh project. Um, so um, Wakakotai's business case approach is a principles based approach and it's fundamental. We had some questions about how we make decisions. Um, the business case is fundamental to how we make decisions for the NLTP. Um, this refresh is focused on improving the overall experience for everyone. We were sending a link was what I think we can't open it. Um, could you contact Lindley? Yes. Um, and we've had quite a bit of feedback from our partners that the business case process is perhaps not as smooth or as easy or as straightforward as it, it could be for everybody to use. So the refresh is to make sure that our processes and the processes that you use are as effective and efficient as possible, but also as well to help us collectively build capability in how we put together cases for investment into the land transport system. Um, we've outlined from everybody's feedback that we've had so far a range of kind of problem statements. Um, and we're um, now open for your feedback via our website on that business case refresh program. And I would encourage you, your officers to review that consultation process and make sure that you get your, your feedback as a council into that. Uh, it will absolutely help to make it easier, uh, but also as well, making sure that we're considering and factoring the right things when we put together a business case so that, that reflects the needs of the region. Um, the, the launch of Maori bilingual traffic signs um, took place uh, earlier last month, it would be in April. Um, Waka Kotai has a vision to support uh, te reo Maori to be seen, to be spoken and to be heard wherever possible to continue to support the revitalization of the language. And the land transport system is something that we all use and we see the signs every single day, everywhere we go. Um, we've been working uh, with a multidisciplinary team uh, alongside Te Matawai uh, and also local government to begin to um, uh, enable the use of bilingual signs right across our network. Um, the Kura uh, school signs have now been formally released. We saw one just a little bit further south was the first one uh, to be officially adopted uh, down in uh, Ahuriri in Napier. And they will begin to get rolled out right across the network. So any signs that are coming up for replacement, uh, it's now under the rule of requirement that it, it needs to be a bilingual Kura sign. Uh, we will be beginning consultation then on the next stages of other bilingual signs um, uh, over the course of the next couple of years. So really, really positive step forwards for us all. I don't think that we've actually managed to have our team join for the um, setting of the speed limits. So we'll jump on to something that is of interest to all and that's driver licensing. And maybe have a bit of a discussion chair on that one. Um, so we are 100% committed. It's the number one priority for our Director of Land Transport, uh, Kane Patana, um, to increase access to driver training and licensing to deliver better outcomes for your community. And significant process, progress has been made in shaping the way forwards, as well as beginning to initialize a series of improvements to how we do that. And that is primarily around equity of access to the system, but also as well how people access the services in your region as well. So there's kind of three main buckets, if you like, uh, of initiatives that are underway. So first and foremost is to improve the testing capacity. And it's uh, in, in areas particularly uh, where we have deemed it to be, let's say, uneconomical to provide a standard service. 
We want to increase the testing locations as well, so that you know people within your region are not having to travel a long, long way to get their test. And also as well to uh, make improvements and make our booking systems much more user friendly. So you will have noted that uh, just prior to the budget announcement, the minister did announce um, additional funding to support an estimated, it's quite a definitive estimate of 64,000 uh, New Zealanders to benefit through improved access to our driver licensing system. Um, importantly within that, it's not just access, but it's the provision of quality support once people say that we want to undertake driver licensing training and support through that system. Um, we have partnered with MSD to help us to do that because embarking on taking your um, theory test and uh, taking your theory licensing is one stage, but getting quality training and support through that process is another. And that's something that MSD will very much take the lead in with Waka Kotahi support. We have established a driver license improvement program, and that is to specifically look at uh, access and equity issues within our system. Um, we're committing to having more driver testing officers on site. So here we heard that one of your very experienced driver testing officers is retiring. Another one has moved on and that left us in a very precarious position within the, the Tairafati driver testing services. Um, in order to overcome that, we are working with uh, Tarafati Reap and also the McInnes Group currently. Um, and we are working to um, launch very soon a pilot in order to look at alternate ways of delivering driver licensing services. I think we have the Director of Land Transport coming up into your region early next month for an official signing of the MO MOU, which will signify the start of that pilot programme. Some of the key things that that will look at is how do we build um, capacity into the driver testing officers so that we can commit to having more than one, more than two, maybe even three here, but also as well, how do we look at where we need to provide other services? So particularly um, uh, in areas where say it's not been deemed that you don't have a roundabout or traffic lights, how do we get a little bit more innovative in ensuring that we can provide testing services there without asking people to have to drive for a long, long way. Um, so that work has started and we should see progress on that uh, as we move through the month of June. And I might just pause there to see firstly if Charlotte was it had anything to add from a GDC perspective and if there's any questions on that one. Is Charlotte still online? I wonder. Oh. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I just turned my camera off. No, I didn't have anything else to add to that. I'll open it up to the meeting because this is something particularly important for this region. Would you like to um, ask a question? Well, my question was how, how the placements were going to be supported from within as you mentioned, Red Bull, and just keen to hear how that was actually going to be implemented. implemented. So the, um, the VTNZ have already covered that gap right here and right now um, with their driver testing officers. I think they've actually brought them in from Bay of Plenty, but that is, that's a, a short-term solution. So that's why we're working with Tyrafati Reap and the McInnes Group to make sure that we've got a longer term program of building capability. <coughs> but as well, we're also uh, working within the Maori uh, and Pacifica communities to make sure that we have driver testing officers that um, understand their communities as well. One more question that maybe that um, stems from that is, um, yes, we've got Tairawhiti, but we've got um, East Coast. So is there some vision as to whether those people are mobile? Are they willing to be mobile to go up the coast for those training purposes or testing purposes? How are you envisaging that? So that was what I mentioned about us looking at different ways of providing driver testing services in areas that we have stated previously that we've been unable to, primarily because the key components of the test have not been part of the, let's say, the roading network there. So that is part of that pilot project. So can we bring in traffic light signals? Are there things there that, you know, have been previously 
you know, generally speaking, are not going to prevent a barrier. Um, the other thing is looking at um, the implementation of mobile theory testing services as well. So that's part of that programme. Back of that, um, it was a huge bonus to have the adventure playground cycle track for young'uns to be sampling, you know, yeah. navigating. Would something be envisaged on, on that basis to be mobilely moved, say, to Rotoria or et cetera, et cetera, to Kaha? Could that be achieved? We're looking at our, a range of interventions. So whether it's something that can be set up and removed and moved place to place, or whether it's something more semi-permanent, will depend on the um, individual locations, the numbers, the travel, and how we... Um, MSD's guidance as well on how we best service some of the remote communities, because as I mentioned, the test is one part, but the support through that test is another part. Councillor mm. Wharton. Uh, yeah, my question, so you talked about the pilot. Yes. Um, I guess my questions are what will be piloted and where? That will be worked out with the McInnes group, the details of the um, actual pilot and where it will occur. And it's got to be community by community and it's got to be fit for purpose for them. But the primary thing is to build capacity and capability into your driver testing services and to make sure as well that wherever possible, people are not having to travel the length of the region to access those services. I think it's Councillor Burdett. I'd be failing in my duty if I didn't uh, <clears throat> talk at length about Highway 35, the condition that's in. I've been here for 24 years. I've travelled quite regularly of late. And I must say, uh, just to put the record straight, our contractors have done a marvellous job, both on our own uh, network, I'm talking about council network, and the emergency work on State Highway 35. If you think back to uh, immediately following <clears throat> the last major fresh, the emergency work just north of Togamora Bay, there were three major, extremely dangerous dropouts. They're fixed. They've done a marvelous job, those contractors. But if you go to page 55 and you have a look, this is on our own, uh, agenda. That's but a minor one compared with other things on the coast. North of there, as you climb out of um, Waikura Valley onto State Highway 35, there's a massive dropout and it has been there for a long time. Cones have been there for a long time, you know, and then come to Gudgeons, which is north of Ticketing. It's like rowing a boat at sea. Come further south and you climb Corporal Hill. I've always banged on about Corporal Hill. There are three major issues there. And I, I'm gonna just qualify why I'm talking at this length here before I ask the question. Yesterday, I was fortunate enough to be invited to a police farewell for a long serving officer out of the Rotoria Police Station. We had the regional commander and the local commander and people from the north. They drove that road. They brought a contingent of about 20 police with them, viral people. And the topic of conversation for quite some time was the condition of Highway 35. Now return to reality in terms of climbing that uh, Corporal Hill. On the Ruatoria side, just above the Waipira Eternal, there's a major dropout, which to the contractor's credit, they are attending to on a regular basis because it's quite dangerous. It keeps slipping, dropping. We know it's erosion prone. Climb over the top and the long standing <coughs> dropout, it's one, one down to one lane, has had bugger all maintenance on it. There are massive potholes. And I'm beginning to wonder just what's going on. North of that is another dropout. So my question, while I don't doubt the authenticity of the report here, my question is, why is it that we have to wait until 1923 to get something done on the road? You know, I understand perfectly about technical stuff, <clears throat> availability of contractors, 
but this one on the Kokoroa Hill will have been two and a half years since it first occurred. Erosion problems aside, this is a state highway. So Linda, I mean, I'm not having a crack at you. I just want to know, because I have an obligation to those people in the Northern Coast. I go to Tangi, I go to community meetings, and <laughs> some of my friends give me a hard time as if I own the road. But I just like to know so I can either get on the radio with them to worship and tell people where we are on this one. Surely we don't have to wait another 12 months to have some action on that road. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Stewart. Can you respond to that, please? Um, absolutely. And um, I very, very much appreciate the position that it places you in. Um, I would just note that our team, your team, uh, and the contractors have been uh, working quite literally night and day to um, ensure that your community is connected. Um, you know far better than I ever will just how challenging some of the environment is that we are working in. Um, some of the significant slips uh, in an emergency works process, we have to make sure that they're safe to be opened. Um, but the longer term process for real fixes requires much more significant work in terms of the engineering and the geotech response. And that is happening right now. We estimate that there's probably a good, unfortunately, four months worth of that work to um, help us with our designs, to get the consent through for us to begin um, to more adequately repair that damage. When it comes to um, Koparoa, there is a drilling rig on another side that is getting moved up to uh, Koparoa in the next two weeks, so you will see some further activity there. We are working really closely with your council on the, the consents for Busby's Hill. There's some challenges there about the, the fill and what we can do with it. But I just want to give some reassurance that we really do understand the importance of the state highway to your community and that there is a lot of work um, in happening to prepare us to, to put these right for the long-term council or Burdett. So thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Burdett. I'd just like to go back to the driver training because, and I see that you have yes, it up on we've got screen. it. We've got a bit more detail there than there's, me just speaking. You know, with the greatest respect, there's a whole lot of fine words there. But yes. what we actually need to see, thank you, Your Worship, is some action and, and some of it just requires, I would suggest, the employment of an ind of individuals who are going to do the training. I mean, there will be places where MSD and E we need to work together, but we've had a long period of being unable to have young people sit training and Wirral have been, I'm not sure what their current position is, but they didn't have training mm -hmm. and people needed to be brought here. So, I mean, a lot of that is going to go on and there'll be a lot of talking um, and maybe not too much delivery of driver training or the encouragement of young people who might have their uh, restricted to move to their full driver's license. So if I can just plead with you to see that um, driver training and qualification is so important to this region. And we've said it before around this table and it didn't sound like much of change from the notes and the minutes, which one of our colleagues has picked up. You know, what you were able to tell us is pretty much what we knew a month, two months ago at the last meeting. So if we can urge Whakakatahi to give attention to that, because it is so important to young people to have the legal piece of paper that enables them to drive. Otherwise they'll be driving anyway, and we do not want them put into that situation simply because the system that is there to provide train, um, qualification and testing is unable to meet its obligations, if you like, or it's now being spread amongst several government departments and it'll be a lot of talking by people who are not really familiar with our area and don't understand what it means for those children and families or teenagers and families who need to get on and get their driver's license. I don't know if Mr. Broderick wants to add anything to that. Uh, not particularly, I've got certainly endorse. I'm, I know, um, and so does um, Linda, that you know, the driving license is not just a, a key to the road, it's a key to many other things as mm -hmm. well, being able to earn your own living, um, keeping you out of the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. um, and then it reduces tensions at home, so family harm is also part of 
all that, so I'm, I'm sure they are fully aware of it, but um, we we'll just endorse that we need it here and we need it here really quickly. Um, uh, Wireall did get a new instructor in um, not too long, uh, just recently, so um, yeah, it, 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 it can work. The testing, oh my goodness, the testing, just need to, um, we need to pad out that and just make it much more efficient than it is. Noted and appreciate your comments. And I would say there are two priority uh, regions for Waka Kotahi, Tairafati and Northland. So absolutely um, a high focus for us. And regrettably, we hear those two areas of priorities for so many things and we keep on hearing it. So we actually need it delivered, please. It is so important. Do, can we just ask, do Wairo now have testing or do they simply only have training? And um, no, it's an, an additional instructor that, 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 that they've put into the area. So uh, they no, they don't have testing. So they have to come together. They still hire them. As they have for a couple of years. Haven't yes. They? Yeah. Yeah. Which is regrettable. It is. We see enough mobile traffic lights put beside earthworks on the highway that surely could be carted off down to Wire or to Ruatoria if you want to practice stopping and starting at a set of traffic lights. We've got them on the road all the time. So, you know, seriously, it can't be too hard. Um, chairperson, um, I'd like to speak to it, uh, Linda. Um, what is um, the potential with public and private companies to forward this a bit more? Like McGuinness is one. Uh, uh, McGuinness is that what's McGuinness? Yeah, yes. I mean that's one. They seem to do. I've seen them all over the place, yes. and they, I'm a teacher at school, so they pop. You know that relationship is in action. Is there is there something in the discussion framework that allows um, a bit more support of the private sector to come in on this? issue apart rather than solely on MSD and, and Waka Kotahi, you know, is there any talk on that in that zone? Um, driver licensing, testing and services, there's a very strong regulatory function. So it's not a kind of open market approach uh, because of the need to have a very, very rigorous, as I'm sure you can appreciate, um, training as well as testing process. Uh, those services are tendered out, so commercial companies can tender for those services, and um, they are predominantly through the AE and VTNZ, uh, but that's, you know, not to prevent others from tendering from it. We do see a number of community initiatives right across the country that involve a, a range of different partners within that, from iwi groups through to um, and uh, entities like the Tairafati REAP, for example, that support and provide both training, funding, uh, and mentoring through that. So there's a number of different ways that communities come together. But I think that while we want to make sure that <clears throat> um, we improve access to the system, we do still want to make sure that the system is robust in terms of the, both the training and the testing services as well because at the end of the day we all want to make sure that those people that are heading out on the road are well equipped and that are safe and you know good drivers off to get the rest of their experience um just a further point just quickly about that my problem um still state um sits with the fact that um sorry um matt mentioned is that <clears throat> these people um still will be driving are out on the roads illegally um I, I appreciate the robustness and i totally support that however if you've done it and doing it on this tier of um, input can it not be boosted to have a greater base of that tier pushed out further so that we're not just doing it to a handful of reap and mcginnis and that but we're doing it 10 times better in terms of public private relationships and robust testing and, and mentoring processes cannot not be more greater funding for that relationship I think there's a funding component but there's also a capacity and capability component to do that and that's one of the things that we are very challenged about we all know that we need more driver testing officers but where do we find them yeah. Just yeah. No, it's, it's a training perspective and it's also a desire to do that as your chosen career as well so there's a number of different facets to that uh, yeah i was just going to add that there's, there's more complexity than just in instructors and examiners there's access to legal cars for testing there's good mentorship for people that are learning there's a huge um and you need other agencies to come along that can provide those facilities for people that are unable 
to provide it themselves. So it's it's a wider scope than um, uh, than uh, just Waka Kotahi can mm -hmm. solve. So we or need to MSD. remember there are parents out there as well. We seem to have not mentioned them at all in the whole conversation. Thank you very much. I think you understand that we feel strongly about the ability for all of the reasons Mr. Roderick said about the first brush of the law happens for young people if they don't get the advice. Yes. And we feel really strongly about that. So we really do want to see some progress. But now that you have the PowerPoint up, we'll go back to you and let you take a turn. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. Okay. Well, this is always in the discussion. Mm -hmm. And we might just jump back one part to the um, land transport rule, the setting of speed limits 2022. I would just like to take an opportunity, yes, sat very um, quietly there, uh, to introduce firstly Mike Creamer. He is the principal project manager of Mike uh, for um, the introduction of uh, how we're all going to collectively work together to enact uh, the new setting of speed limit rule and what that specifically means for Gisborne District Council and this RTC. Um, I would just note we're working closely with your officers so there's probably a level of detail that you'll want some comfort in and understanding but just know that collectively our two teams are working together and also has joined us is Ian McCauley, he's team leader of Safe System Support. So I'll hand over to them to just give us a, a very brief overview of what the new rule means in a, in a practical sense for your council, for your region and for this RTC. Over to you, Mike. Sure, thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you for allowing us to be here. It's an honour and privilege to um, be here and to Know, get a real understanding of some of the concerns um, and it's certainly enlightening for me. Um, the work that we've been doing is um, as stated around the setting of speed limits rule um, and so that has come into force last Thursday um, which is a you know, small milestone for us. Um, the next major piece of work is um, helping RCAs and regional councils and RTCs to understand what that means for them. Um, so we'll start with you because clearly that's your um, potentially um, first point of interest. Um, when a um, speed limit wants to be changed then there's a thing called a speed management plan um, and that will come to you two times. So the first time it has gone through a process of uh, the RCAs gaining agreement on how they want to approach speed and infrastructure and speed cameras across all of their different areas, um, working in much the same way as they do now on developing up a program of work um, and presenting that through to you as a um, fairly concise and consistent view of the way that speeds are being changed across or proposed to be changed across the region. Um, the role for you at that point is to check with the regional council that the process has been followed and then endorse for consultation. Um, then it goes out to consultation and uh, six or seven months later it will come back to you as having gone through a process um, for you to then uh, endorse it to go to the director uh, for certification of those speed management plans. What that means is um, you then have gone through a consultation process and the speeds can be changed and they get put into um, a quite exciting new register of um, speed limits. So rather than passing bylaws, then it all happens inside of the register. Um, and that's about it, really. Um, so from your point of view, um, you will receive uh, a document effectively that has probably a cover page basically saying, um, hi, we've gone through this process. You can rest assured that all of the boxes have been ticked. Um, and from there, uh, you uh, endorse it for consultation. Um, and the second time, probably six or eight months later, then endorse it through to the director. Behind the scenes, there's a little more going on. Um, so the regional council has a role in coordination. Um, so 
very first step in the process is for the regional council to pull together a set of uh, principles and the way that priorities want to be set across the region. Um, they're not doing that alone. There is quite a lot of uh, help and assistance uh, from both Wakatahi and from the other regions. So uh, you will not be the first region who are doing this. And so you- um, Mike, sorry, can yep. I just interrupt? Just bear in mind that Gisborne District Council are a unitary authority. So it's a little bit different to for in some of the other regions. Great, sorry, I've forgotten that. Good reminding. Um, so uh, as a unitary authority, there's a slightly different process in that you're both an RCA and a regional council. Um, and so the, process is similar in that um, if you, and I'm sure you will, have other RCAs who join in the process, uh, then you play both those roles. So you pull together the RCAs and um, develop that overview and uh, equally then as an RCA go and uh, develop up the material for the plan and then in your role as regional council, bring those back together and present them through to this group. Um, it's fairly easy when you say it quickly. Um, there is quite a level of detail that's in there. Um, fair to say that much of the work that needs to be done is being done already. So um, the RCAs that we've talked to, um, which don't include RCAs in the Gisborne region, to be fair. Um, but the RCAs that we've talked to um, say that they go through a process, they develop a program of work, and this is simply a um, uh, larger scale view of how all of those pieces of work come together. Um, and because it's Hi. larger scale, yo. Um, what do you see are the key changes for in this new rule for Gisborne District Council and for this RTC, just to get to the, the fine point for this RTC in particular? How will they see a change as a we're result only one of this? Because we're yeah. Area. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so the change is that um, the speed management plan is every three years. So rather than consulting um, at different points during the, those three years, you'll pull together all of the things that you want to do over that three years and develop a plan in much the same way as the RLTP process works. So 10 year vision, three years of these are the things that we want to do leading towards that vision um, and then consult on that. So that's different. Um, there's a intention that the consultation is on principles and priorities. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, instead of saying we want to change uh, the speed on this road outside the school, um, the principle would be we want all the speeds outside of our uh, urban schools to be 30 kilometers an hour. And then consult on that. Um, and then can we ask why? If, I mean, for something that's reasonably important like that, that um, slide suggests the framework is faster and easier with greater regional consistency, mm. and yet above. And, and many people, and Mr. Hadfield's done it often, um, we've needed to reduce speed around schools. It's given you until 2027 to reduce speed around schools, and yet the process is meant to be faster and more simple. Um, there's a lot of, and Dave, you might want to jump in, there's a lot of pre-work required to develop overall your regional speed management plan. So in a nutshell, it's looking at the whole of your network, how you want it to function, and where you want your 30 kilometres, your 50, your 80, your 100, and making sure that it's logical for your communities. But the priority here is how do we make sure that particularly in your high risk areas, that it's done as swiftly as possible. And for many, not for all, but I think for many outside Kura, outside schools is a high priority. We have to be cognizant that 
lots of districts and lots of regions are at different stages of their adoption of speed management, but we have to put a line in the sand as to when we want to see that happen. Here in Gisborne, you're quite far advanced in your, both your discussions within your community and your willingness to, to get out there and engage with the community. So that's, um, it's a longer target for you. I think you could probably get them in place before then. But I think the important thing here is that once that speed management plan is in place, it provides you from a platform, a principle-based approach to engage with your community. And it allows you to enact those changes much more swiftly than the bylaw process has enabled you previously. The one little thing that we need to, excuse me, my voice has just decided to go for some reason. Um, that we will need to work collectively on is how our local roads and state highways work together. So our teams will need to make sure that that works logically together. Um, um, I think that's probably it in a nutshell. I think one thing for Gisborne District Council is you're quite far along this road anyway, for want of a better term. Thank you. Very thank much. you. Um, thank you, Ian. If you could say thank you to... Um, Mike as well, that would be great. I will do, thank you. Thanks for your time again. Thank you, back to your presentation. I think we've probably covered the walking cycling of the Wawi Cup Gorge. Oh, actually, can I just apologise and interrupt? I did see Mr. Trooper's hand up at the end of the last presentation before the speed change. So Mr. Trooper, was your question around um, the previous pre um, driver licensing issues that we were debating? It was actually uh, before that, but I think I can bring both together. Well, Stuart, thank you for your report. Uh, just if it could be noted that um, you know, it's commendable that uh, Te Waka Kotahi are looking at um, signage in Tereo, and words like kura are quite generic and can be used in any tribal area. but. Tribal areas do differ, particularly we use sentences or phrases. And if it could be noted that if there are going to be signs like that in this area, that there needs to be consultation with local iwi about the correct wording. Um, secondly, regarding um, the uh, uh, speed management, um, I was interested where there's reference to kura in schools. Um, I'd like to suggest that as part of, as we put together principles locally for consultation purposes, that we also include villages and also marae. Uh, for example, at Waituhi, they're just uh, a very short drive from town here. There are three marae in very close proximity to each other, which are used often. Um, also, um, there are marae in a very similar situation as Councillor Burdett would confirm on the East Coast. Uh, which are well used and often used, close to which are kura and also urupa. And I would like to think that as we start this process, that um, there could be an expansion beyond kura in schools, particularly in our region. Kia ora. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Sorry, Thank you. Thank you. Back to your presentation. Um, so, sorry, I think we've probably covered um, the walking and cycling in a previous item. The Waiwika Gorge, the business case is nearing completion. That should be completed by the end of this month. And then we'll be coming back out to the stakeholder and the community groups that have been involved and fed into that uh, with an update of where to from here. So the preferred solutions will be recommended uh, in that business case. And then that will be put forward for uh, funding in the 24 to 27 NLTP. Um, the 50 max bridge upgrades, the thank you to your team. There was quite a fulsome update on that work in their report, I won't dwell. Um, the speed uh, speed reviews that are pending, just following on from our previous discussion, um, we're having uh, quality uh, discussions with our iwi partners, um, just to pick up on um, uh, Councillor um, Tupura's points with regards to access ways and Kura, Urupa and Marae along the state highways. So we are looking at taking a, an iwi-led uh, approach to our engagement for the state highway speed reviews. 
Um, we'll be confirming a date for engagement later on this year. It will be just engagement at this stage. So looking at feedback from your communities as to how they feel they're experiencing the speed across the, the state highway networks, where they think it's fine, but where they would like to see perhaps some adjustment for a variety of reasons. And then to an earlier corero uh, around uh, renewals, maintenance and uh, operations, you can see here that um, our resale programme has been impacted due to the weather event. So we have been unable to complete all of the planned reseals due to the disruption in March. Um, the uncompleted sites will be deferred uh, into next year's programme. We are still planning because it's critically important to complete 100% of the drainage renewals. So they're at almost 70% at the moment. And um, thank you very much to the hard work of the Gisborne District Council team on our collective approach to the, the AC works that's happening in your city too. Um, it's, uh, I had some good feedback about the quality of your team's work uh, from the local taxi driver on my way here. <laughs> um, I'll just ask a question oh, before you go off there, go with it. respect to the resales and, the, and we understand the circumstances so, that has required resale to be pushed out, yes. but can we expect that both those that have been pushed out, plus that which is determined to have been done in the 22-3 financial year will be able to happen? Because otherwise we're going to be forever lagging behind. Trying to catch up. So um, we, that is absolutely the intent, Chair hoping that we don't get three more weather events in the one year. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, just lastly, as I know that it is uh, a hugely important uh, part of the network and it's uh, been of concern to members of your community and to the, the committee for some time. Um, the challenge that we face here is that we're caught in a, a cycle of emergency works. Um, and the emergency works for, uh, for particularly for this part of the network is um, addressing what's there as a result of the weather event. It's not addressing the long term fix, if you like. So the, the point of entry as to how we fix that has been a critical piece of work. Um, at the moment, we have all of the aggregates, all of the large rocks. Uh, on uh, site and ready to go. We're just waiting for our consent to be approved through the council. And then that will allow us to commence the work, hopefully in May, to provide a much longer term and secure fix to this piece of uh, your network. Um, right now you can see, and I was up there not so long ago, at just how close is getting to the edge of that, that road. Um, but um, that's uh, ready to go, I understand. When I say the um, rock's not on site, <clears throat> so it might be accumulated in the city, but there's no material on We have it all at the downer quarry. Yes. It's all stockpiled, Sorry, ready to go. Yeah, yeah. Not the, they're not in place yet. <laughs> they will be, once we get our consent. Right. Um, and the Eastland Port access, um, we're still waiting for them just to lodge their consent for the expansion of the, um, the port. Once that's done, that will trigger uh, us to begin to have a look at the intersection and what needs to be done there to improve the safety and access way. And before I lose my voice entirely, I've got to stop. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Herbert. Um, <clears throat> It was a great presentation. I just want to take you back to the bilingualization of road signage mm -hmm. and remind Waka Kotahi that sign language is a third official language. Great. And it would be great to see that addressed as well. Ooh. Nice. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any first questions? That is actually report um, page 20, um, report 2296 on page 47. It is not the end of Waka Kotahi's report, there's mm. another um, whole report. So are there any questions with respect to that material? Councillor Cranston. Yeah, it's a little bit of a tangent, but it's something that I've had the community out here on my case for, and I've spoken to Dave Wilson about it. Uh, there's a bizarre sign out here. If you go along Wairiri Road and you're coming north, you come to a turn, which is almost a right angle, which takes you up to State Highway 35. As soon as you come around that corner, you see the 50 uh, kilometre sign has got a 60 on it. And within 
10 metres of that sign, you hit the state highway, and then you, if you turned left within uh, 25 metres, you would then be at an 80 kilometre zone. So it just seems bizarre that you come around on this 50 kilometre an hour zone, and for a period of mere metres, it changes to 60, and it's just right before you're at a give way. Um, the whole community's commenting on it, so I just... Uh, I said, to, I did mention Dave Wilson, but he said it's uh, Waka Kotahi, uh, Waka Kotahi sign. So I just uh, don't understand it myself. I, yeah, I've had a look at it and can't see any rationale for have a 60 kilometre sign there. So I just wanted to bring bring the attention to that one. Um, thank you for that. Um, just, it would be good to get some clarification uh, on exactly what intersection um, that is. I am aware that there are some concerns around a speed sign on one of the paper roads for a local community. I'm just not sure if that's the same no, no. intersection no, so, that you're talking yeah, about. Wairu Road coming north, it changes uh, by the bridge there when you're coming out onto the back onto the main road. Wairiri Road. Wairiri yes. Wairiri and Moana. Road and Moana. We'll have a look at that. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, Councillor. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cranston. Would someone like to move the yeah. noting report? Thank you, Mr. Bird Councillor Bird. Uh, I know that there have been probably two or three business cases prepared for the entranceway to the port. And there has never been a resolution. I can recall with the former mayor having gone to meet all those businesses running up there and telling them there will be no more parking. However, given that your <clears throat> organization are onto this by way of a business plan, will we get some resolution in terms of the entrance way to the port finally? That is precisely what the point of entry will do. We will bring all of that previous work out and we'll actually have a look at what the real issues are and what the options are to resolve it. So once we get some definitives around the, the port's expansion and they get that consent lodged, that will trigger that process. Thank you. Uh, so there's no further questions to that paper. I'll put the recommendation moved by Councillor Burdett, seconded Councillor Wars, and I've let the paper be noted, and that is paper 2296. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Now, back to you. Thank you, uh, Ms Stewart. We move to the update, and you've all got that PowerPoint tabled, um, which I think you were going to seek questions. So. Yes, happy to take any questions. I think we've had covered quite a lot of ground, but if there's any further questions in there, particularly around the weather events, happy to take them. Councillor was not Just noting the five native revegetation sites. Um, page, please. Uh, I don't know. Page. Page. Wave it in. Oh, yeah, thank you. This is the page is yeah. the yellow and green box. Um, go you. Very, you know, great, lovely initiative. Um, However, I note that um, native revegetation re or vegetation full stop requires quite a bit of ongoing maintenance. Mm -hmm. And um, if you just look at Busby's Hill, for example, where fairly recently, not that long ago, that work was all done, and now it is um, pampas mostly and wilding pines. Um, so, just whether or not the revegetal, you know, the tree planting, uh, is also funded with the requisite amount of ongoing care to ensure that it becomes, um, you know, a, a cover of native vegetation as opposed to a cover of weeds, in which case it would have been better to be grass in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I know it's something that's, you know, good. there's a lot of goodwill behind it, yep. but pragmatically it has to be maintained or else it just becomes something that you chop down later on. Through you, Chair, it's an excellent point and it's um, a multifaceted issue in terms of the planting and especially the use of natives. 
there's a timing to actually plant them for them to take hold and they provide a lot of stabilization to the the soil types around the the sides of the network then at the the same time we have to balance that with the available funds to undertake the maintenance of that and it's a it's an ongoing balance is the only thing I could say and um, those hillsides and slopes will always perform better where they are planted um, but there are some challenges for us on this network to both maintain them and keep them there while the plants take as well, Councillor Warsnock. I'd just like to follow that up because um, the predecessor to Ms Stewart used to hear me on all the time about the amount of planting that goes on in other new roadworks around New Zealand compared to how much happens here in Tairapi. And we have had a little bit of planting, but really Busbys Hill got very little planting. If you look at the one location, which is on the south end of Busbys Hill, that was planted on the day it was opened by children from the Kura and the Member of Parliament at the time. And they're nice large established plants. They're not on the most eroding side of the hill. The other side is, is exactly as Council was not said, now weeds and wilding pines. And certainly our previous council officer had those wilding pines removed and uh, two or three years ago, they do need to be removed. They need to be removed from the sidling on Panika, at the end of the Panika Road. Otherwise, they just become a large obstruction that gets too close to the highway and obscures vision. And they're quite substantially growing on the side of the road at Panika, on the state highway, but at the access to Panika Road. So I do think we need a share of, um, a bigger share of the planting that happens around New Zealand, but need to be done at the time and a bit of maintenance. We need the weeds removed, which is something I was going to put on my list because Pampas, which to your credit, Whaka Kotahi started dealing with Pampas maybe two years ago, but <coughs> haven't been back to it. And so therefore it's spreading again. Farmers do not have Pampas growing in their paddocks. It is a weed that this district is I'm now dealing with that we never had 10 years ago. So I implore you to get the Pampas dealt with again. I mean, you did start and it was committed to on State Highway 35 as far as Tolaga and somewhere south, but it needs to be followed up because as Council of not said, it just grows and grows again. So I implore you to deal with wilding pines on Pampas and to keep, to ensure that when these large cuttings are implemented, that there is a budget for planting and that it happens right away because you Waka Kotahi put a huge amount of effort into planting the side of the highways mm. last year with quite small native plants <coughs> and probably 50% of them will grow if we went looking for them and maybe they'll pop out of the grass and the weeds this winter but everyone, I mean we all know because we travel the coast, they've got a little bamboo pole by them a few of them collapsed in the last rain event but not that many, there will be a lot there given another year's growth I would suggest but we do need to get rid of pampas and wilding pines on the side of the highway. I just want to ask about um, this box too, because you've got a reduced number of sites will be delivered due to cost escalation. So they were passing opportunities that were promised by Whakakotahi two or three years ago, and it's in the very top box. And, you know, it makes one ask in defence of our region, if the work was done more expeditiously, there wouldn't have been time for the cost escalation to be so great. I would say that that is a fair challenge, but as well in defence of our team um, and the contractors, there's a lot of work that has to go into actually planning for them. And we know from um, the issues that Councillor Burdett has previously raised, it is not as straightforward as if we were in um, Palmerston the North, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and we have been the unfortunate uh, experience, as we all are, and we heard earlier that the council's in the same position of trying to manage those budgets in the face of extreme pressures right now. Um, oh. Chairperson, can I add to your comment um, regarding the Pampas? Um, um, towards Linda there, if I could address Linda, thank you, through the chair. Um, the Pampas, uh, uh, when you consider your request, um, that is on the roadways. However, um, it's also present on the cycleways and it's um, quite, uh, it causes quite a lot of injury quite quickly because it, it um, overshadows the cycleway and you either have to go through it or go round it and you, it becomes a two way, it becomes a one way. If you go through it, it's very cutty. I mean, these are small issues, but does the cycleway come in under that request? Who deals yes. with the cleaning of the weeds on the cycleway? Like um, the one I'm 
you know, directly relating to is the one from Wainui to town. There is considerable weed growth that impacts on the good use of the cycle and making it a one way, and a lot of that is pampas. Thank you. Um, I'll answer that one first. That will depend if it's a cycleway alongside a state highway and if it's ours or if it's a, a local road. A clarification on and that, thank you. Also as well, um, you know, without putting too fine a point on it, it comes down to budget and what our contractors can actually deliver for the budget that they have. Um, if they, you know, I've got spraying here, they haven't got spraying there. If they work on this section of road, they can't work on that section of road. Um, so I take your point. It's a, it's a very difficult one to manage when we're under extreme financial and resource pressures as to how that is applied. Um, just on the to jump back one point, though, we just had clarification. Thank you to Richard, who I think must be watching from heaven somewhere. Um, he's just said that for every um, planting project, there's three years worth of maintenance of those built in. So for when it's native revegetation, there is three years worth right. of maintenance to get them up Definitely. out the ground, I presume, yeah. above the weeds. Nice, thank, thank you. you. That sounds fantastic. And thank you to the gentleman that provided that information. I just want to note too, on the, back to the schedule, because those passing lanes that actually have been implemented in the top box on State Highway 2 and 35, none of them are on the East Coast. There are five sites completed and two under construction on um, Tatapuri northbound, and um, that is on State Highway 35. The next one is not, I don't think, unless my geography is really bad. And State Highway 35, we need to commend the work that has been done on the Oak to Makarori headland. I'm, I know nobody would have anticipated such a huge piece of work and so much soil needing to be moved, but I don't know that this in, that isn't exactly where the um, passing lane is going to be, is it? So it says Tatapuri northbound, under construction. I haven't seen one under construction, Tatapuri northbound. It's on the second, it's at the end of the first box, the first yellow box. I know that one of them was significantly impacted by the recent weather event and has had to be paused until the next construction season. I just need to double check if it is that one though, Chair. Well, it hadn't started. Unless we we'll get your response from Richard to his in communication. That's great. Thank you. That's because it's so important. We'll do it to real our time. Mm. Uh, do any other members of the panel have a um, comment to make? Because you're all yes, welcome is. to ask. Sorry, Tatapuri Hill, the slow vehicle bay is on hold until spring. Well, um, essentially, we've had to reprioritize the emergency work. Mm. So, can the PowerPoints be? Up to speed when you have to change things because the emergency work did happen about a month ago. Madam Chair, yes, certainly. I know Gardner more than my rapid tea plant, but I do know through our experience at the Marae, planting natives, they need shelter to start to give them a good start in life. They need to be properly maintained and given our weather conditions in our district, watered regularly. Well, it's good to hear this gentleman has advised that there's three years maintenance you know, funded, well, so well, let's hope that... Listen to that, but my observation mm. tells me that there wasn't been a plant, and now half the them are in the water table. Yeah. Can I just cl clarify, the three years maintenance, does that include uh, removing competition weeds? Or is it just... Release. Just release it. So in theory, wild and kind of I will I will defer and come back to you on that one as to whether it supports, nurtures them to grow or reduces com competitors for growth as well, Richard, if you're hearing. <laughs> Is there any, are there any other questions around the table with respect to this work there on the HPMV bridge strengthening completion, Napier to Apotiki, and reporting on the ash belting program? I just wanted to say well done on, um, I think the work that has been done, I, I concur with everything that everyone said. There's an enormous amount that has been done. I think um, what's probably, that this might be the honeymoon phase because we don't have in front of us the specifics of the numbers of what there is yet to do. 
Um, but certainly there's some bits of very, very busy people. And uh, I think collectively we're all very grateful for that. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Thank you. That's very fair. I do think again, though, that this paper needs updating because I do understand we're not going to be able to. We're not going to be doing the up, upgrade and uh, the ash building of the Basin Road Bridge now because of this weather. It's yeah. not. No, I believe that the it's still to go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the comms have gone out today that it's, uh, yeah. it's still on, uh, whether it's been. It still literally on. went out maybe right. two hours ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Because there was some debate about whether it was too cold or too wet for asphalt to be successful. And, you know, you know it's resales that have been done today, both uh, downers and Port and Ivy, have been done well. They have. Very successful. Mm. Chair, through you, can I just come back to Councillor Warson, Richards come in that um, it includes weeding and it includes replacing any plants that have died for a three year period. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for sourcing that information. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, wherever you are. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I think they come in on the, um, the stream. On the street, my stream. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. We are on the last page. But we are on the last one more. There's one more to go, I'm oh. afraid, but it's, I, you, you don't need to continue to hear from me. No, no, we're looking forward to it. The strategic case for freight and logging. So we've, moved, we've finished, we've moved and adopted our Waka Kaukahi update report. So we move to um, paper 22129, strategic case for freight and logging. Thank you. Um, I will uh, pass over to my colleague, Sarah Downs, who's leading this piece of work. Um, I think it was not the last uh, RTC, but the one prior, we introduced the, as a central North Island leadership team, the impact of um, forestry on the local road, state highway, on our networks. Um, we're all aware that there's both the opportunities it creates, but also the pressures that it creates. And our current way of working needs to be reviewed holistically by both local government, central government, but also as well the, the sector itself. So Sarah is leading this piece of work and uh, wanted to both bring you up to date with where it is, but also as well seek some feedback. So I'll pass over to you, Sarah. Um, kia ora, and thank you for accepting this paper quite late in the piece. Um, one of the things, I think it was December, where we mentioned that we were looking at this as a strategic piece of work and we're wanting um, um, the Central North Island to really consider what it meant to them and how we could work better together. So um, we've done a lot of internal thinking and we've actually agreed to look at a strategic case. A strategic case in the business case process actually looks at what the problem is. And so what you've got in the attachment is um, an outlining of, of the problem. It's not going to a solution at the moment, but it's providing a strategic way forward to what needs to happen next in terms of um, how we manage the ongoing issue of um, um, the impact of freight and in particular, um, heavy logging trucks on, on the network. So the strategic case will outline a pathway forward into um, other pieces of work that will actually be required to be able to provide us with a, a path going forward. And that would include perhaps a proactive maintenance pro program where we target certain roads to the ports um, which allow those roads to get um, an increased level of maintenance. It would probably include a, um, an economic case for um, at what point do we transfer logs from road to rail. Um, that, that would be a, a very economical piece of work. And, and then it will also look at potentially how we work together so that it's not just one council or one road, road, road controlling authority managing the issue by themselves as well. It will also consider any regulatory um, 
abilities that we've got to, to manage um, the network. So for example, um, Stratford District Council in Taranaki are actually going through a process at the moment of um, targeted rates on the forestry blocks. No, we did it anyway. Yeah, it um, there, there is, but it's about increasing the amount of um, rates that they pay because and general, we, generally yeah. late rates are done on land value and not necessarily the, the product that comes off, off the land. So um, I'm looking more at that. So are there any initiatives out there at present? So we're about to kick off the strategic case. We are keen for your thoughts I'll, I'll take that the memo has been read if you've got any questions please ask and um, the questions i've asked for consideration are you comfortable with the context of the strategic case um, is there anything missing that we've not thought about um, and are you comfortable with the proposed approach and and are you happy that um Waka Kotahi works alongside Gisborne on this and who needs to be involved and what level of input do you as a regional transport committee want into this piece of work? Um, I would like to acknowledge that once we've done the strategic case and we get into a, a programme business case, that will need um, greater input as well from our um, partners um, at the ports and from the freight and logging industry as well. So um, I have regular catch-ups now with Philip Pope from um, the Eastlands um, Logging Council and um, making sure that we're well aligned. Um, I, I also appreciate that all councils have a lot of information on what they've already, what you know. Um, this is an opportunity to make it a regional approach to this so that we can, the whole region can be stronger together with this. So we're not all just going out for separate bits of funding to manage our net parts of the network, but actually get it focused on the central North Island and, and growing that strength. Um, we have included Wellington as part of, of this study because certainly in Taranaki and Manawatu, there is a point where um, logs either go Napier or to Port Taranaki or down to Wellington. So it, it's making sure that that story is joined up. So happy to take any questions. I, I'd just like to refer to, um, I'll come to you in two shakes, to Mr. Hadfield, because if we look at the stage two comments on the current state, most of that information council officers would be able to provide at the drop of a hat, because they have worked with the industry for a long time. Yeah. Uh, would that be correct, Mr. Hadfield? Yes, that's correct. That we've been working with their funding advisors with Rob as well in terms of um, our 50 max um, programs as well to, to uh, assist it. That's fine. Sorry? Oh, thank you. Um, I'll take Councillor Warsnop and then Councillor Cranston. Councillor Warsnop. Oh, thank you, Ms. Meister. Um, yeah, I just want to welcome. Um, I want to welcome this initiative um really highlight that in many ways a strategic approach is about 30 years overdue uh at least in this region's context i know the forest sector would probably wholeheartedly support me in that statement um i think the heavy freight routes that we recently tried and have not been successful in implementing probably just highlight how difficult it is to reactively apply uh you know in, in a remediation to what is known to be an issue uh, in actual fact if you designated your heavy freight routes 30 years ago none of it would be an issue we would have funded the appropriate wood we wouldn't be being into school children and all the issues that we now have would have been averted so um i guess from that perspective even if we solve i, I guess the problems 10 20 or 30 years from now at least that strategic approach if it's initiated it begins to bite somewhere along the line and, and we don't end up with some of the issues that we have today. Um, there is enormous benefit to being more strategic in the way that we apply, um, you know, what we know about our roads and how we use them. Um, my question just a little bit with regards to this region is, uh, we don't have a lot road-wise in common with the central North Island. 
Um, so we, A, we, do, we don't at the moment have anything going on rail, whereas there's a, an awful lot of logs that are on the um, rail uh, from Whakatane through to Tauranga. Um, we do have a lot in common with Wairua South. Um, so just how you, how you define the, the boundaries, um, there's an awful lot of internal roads that uh, forestry use in the Central Plateau. That, that we don't, well, we do have some, but to nothing like the extent that they do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that just nutting out for, if, if this is a, um, I guess, a, a study or, you know, an idea um, that you're wanting to be reasonably consistent, um, I, I wonder almost if there's, there's almost some subsectors within that, because we do have a shared boundary with Bay of Plenty, but it's a very, you know, there's some logs from Gisborne that will end up down the Bay of Plenty, but they're limited to Marawai, Motu, very, very few. So we actually have quite a hard boundary in lots of aspects. Um, compared to Wairua, where it's a very soft boundary, where you can have logs coming out of the Rukatui Valley that are coming down to our port, or you can have ones from Tinirotu that are going down and getting on a log train to Wairua, and, uh, in Wairua and out to Napier. So um, understanding probably where you want your boundary and for what purpose, I think is, is quite vital to making sure that you get information that's useful to you. Thank you for that. And Thank that, you, Councillor Walker. Councillor Francis? Oh, yeah, thanks for that. Chair, I, see, um, I was just going to say, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Sorry. I think through the chair that the strategic case will flush out some of those um, questions and will help define what happens in the next stage of, of the business case process. Councillor Crenson, thank you. Yeah, you mentioned that you're looking at what point logs might go to rail and that, but. Uh, as we've discussed uh, time and time again, the issues of our roading is north of here, the roads north of here. And um, so do you think you'll give full consideration to coastal bar log barging or, or coastal shipping for logging? Because uh, the likelihood of building a rail line from here to Hicks Bay is 100% unlikely. Um, but whereas coastal logging could happen quicker and be actually easier. Is that going to be part of the consideration? Through the chair, I think that's a, an excellent suggestion. And since we do have an activity class, can you speak up? Oh, sorry. Since we do have an activity class now in coastal shipping, um, I think that is an excellent suggestion, and certainly would be within the scope of what we would want to consider. All right. Thanks, Matt. The time frame for this project, or is it? Um, the, in terms of the time frame, um, I'm, I haven't got one set yet, but certainly I want to be at the stage where we can start thinking about funding for the 24, 27 and LTP in terms of some of that um, proactive maintenance and certainly working with our councils on that. Um, um, the strategic case is being managed and um, funded through um, my part of um, Waka Kotahi business, and but we will then have to apply for funding um, for investment planning funding for um, a further piece of work around the program business case. So um, I am hoping that certainly a strategic case can be done this side of um, Christmas. Mm -hmm. Through the chair um, to um, Sarah. Um, Put your speaker on because the others can't hear. It was, uh, oh, sorry, I'm not too soft. Too soft. Um, I recall when I was at my first meeting that this was um, the draft was delivered, as you, you mentioned, not last meeting, but the meeting before this. Uh, and I raised um, how, because um, that's my perspective as a community advisor, to think about the cycling walking aspect. And um, the response was it was still in draft, so we're here now, so that's great. Um, my question then still stands is how, and it's raised in the um, discussion in option seven, going over the page, and it says assessments of significance, the effects on individuals, the specific communities, and um, I'd like to have it noted that I feel that um, a specific community is the walkling cycling, because we're always going to encounter those entries to port 
And um, yes, we've got vehicles, but we've also got walkers and cyclists. And I bike past that um, turn off into the port um, nearly every day. Um, and at this point, there's no consideration for cyclists at that point, not because it hasn't been concepted, but I want to have it noted that I believe that is a specific community that needs to be incorporated in this um, strategic case and those those. And um, through the chair, I think that's um, a good consideration because one of the things that we could look at when we look at the priority routes for logging trucks and um, heavy freight is that we would want them to be well away from that interaction with your most vulnerable um, users of, of the network or separation. So um, certainly um, there, there are opportunities to consider um, through this and outline. So I, I have made a note of making sure that um, when we look at this, that consideration to people who walk and cycle are, are part of that consideration. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Weatherall, do you have any comment to make on the paper? Uh, just the fact that this council will say it's been Excuse me, can you press the button? Hmm. You don't have to have it too close. It's just um, so that others can hear. Thank you. With another review of the whole oh, I uh, I thoughts on whether well or no suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure that you'll have access to that report, won't you? Um, the chief executives confirmed that we'll get a copy of the, the report and the letter that was sent to the minister on Friday. Thank you. Councillor Wars not. It's a question um, with the coastal shipping being included as a, what was the definition? It's now, you know, a, yeah, a legitimate form of transport. Um, does that mean that wharves may not be 100% local funded in the future? What was the last bit? Wharves, Mike. Wharves, wharves, etc. I need to confirm that one. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Would make sense, wouldn't it? Um, through the chair, um, I understand with the barging um, conversation, um, there has been quite a bit of resistance from Iwi and Hapu up the coast. Um, I haven't heard really any mention of them being a significant um, contributor to the strategic case. Has that um, invitation been sent um, to these people as well, or our people, um, Iwi, Hapu? Mm. So in all our business cases, uh, it, with all our business cases, um, as a Crown entity, we have a responsibility to work with our iwi partners, so, yeah. There was a coastal shipping announcement yesterday, or two days ago, and I understand about 1,000 people from the top of the coast have signed in support of, but we are aware that there was a number of people concerned about the environmental yeah. issues, so um, that will need to be well traversed. 
Councillor Warsnop. Yeah, just probably some of the most challenged uh, environments that we have obviously are north and the further north you get, um, there's a lot more, there, obviously we've got some significant uh, industrial sort of players, but we've also got a, a huge number of small blocks and they tend to be the ones that are impacted first when either the fuel price goes up or the log price goes down. So uh, I don't know to what extent or how, how granular um, the review will be, um, but certainly with regards to the pulses of logs that we have, that, that's a big determinant. If the bigger players can afford to keep funding logs, you know, moving, even, even when it's not necessarily economic for them, whereas the smaller players just, they can't. So we have a lot of that further away you get from town that, that starts to come into play. And I suspect, again, that's probably different to what you'll see in the, the middle of the island. Mm. But we're just contained within the report where it talks about quantum and volume. So we'll be able to gather some of that information. Or Miss Noble's team will be gathering lots of information to assist in this. Thanks. So is there any further questions around that paper? Thank you very much, Ms. Downs, for that interesting information around this rate study. We'd just love to see Pokotokahi help us with our funding. We're very impressed by all the studies that are being done that we really appreciate that. But we are in the dire circumstances right now to see repairs and maintenance done on our roads. So thank you very much for coming. We appreciate you potentially give you a hard time about the things that are challenging for us. But Tarapiti is on the end of the line, if you like. And if we don't use the opportunities that are given to us, when we have offices from um, departments in Wellington here, we're not serving our community well. So we appreciate very much, um, Ms. Stewart, that you listen patiently to the issues that we raise with you and uh, hopefully they'll get taken back. We're impressed that you took the time to ride a log truck to actually really see what yeah, goes on in the region. Um, just back to Councillor Cranston, if you're still there, have you anything further you wish to raise before we close the meeting, Councillor Cranston? No, I'm fine, thanks. We've lost Mr. Uh, Chipper, I think. Yes, I, I don't know if you can hear me, Madam Chair. I've lost my camera. Yeah, we can hear and you. just before, yeah, just before we close, just to let you know, Councillor Cranston will close. Will provide the closing cut again. Thank you. We're not quite there yet, but I'm just giving people the opportunity to ask any final question. Thank you for that, Mr. Tupper and Councillor Cranston. Is there any further um, matter on the table that anyone wishes to raise? Thank you, Ms. Stewart. Um, thank you for your kind words and I'd just like to provide reassurance that um, for myself but for our regional leadership team for Rob and the team on there you are not at the tail end of the world we're 100% committed uh, to Tairafati and we all genuinely love to work with you it's a um, challenging region but with that brings a lot of opportunities to closely partner so um, we'll be taking more opportunity to come and visit you more frequently so thank you. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Hadfield, for your team and the team that have seen um, so much maintenance happen and the work that's going on to put the case to Whakakotahi for increased funding for the maintenance that still needs to be done. So we appreciate the challenges that the climate threw upon us over the last few months. And we'll continue, but our traveling public are going to suffer that for the rest of the winter. So we hope we can see some work done. So thanks everybody. Um, and I'll then turn to Councillor Cranston and invite you to close the meeting. Yeah, nā mihi, uh, Mr. Tupera, uh, anei taku karakia. Te whakaae tangi e, te whakaae tangi e, tēnei te kaupapa ka e, tēnei te whawānanga ka e. Te mauri o te kaupapa, ka whakamoia, te mauri o te wānanga, ka whakamoia. Kua ki runga, kua ki rāo, haumi e, hui e, tāiki e. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to share the meeting. Thank you very much for attending.